Okay, so in chapter 8, we're going to talk about infectious processes. Uh, in this chapter, we'll start out talking about epidemiology, um, disease transmission, and wrap up the chapter talking about the um, major types of infectious microorganisms. So when we talk about epidemiology, it's really just the study of, of health events and diseases, uh, as well as the distribution of diseases and the causative factors that uh, could result um, from a, in a defined population. So in short, you know, epidemiology is really just a study of how diseases are spread um, in a given population. Uh, there's different terms that epidemiologists will use to describe disease. Uh, the word prevalence is used to describe the number of people who have the disease in a given year. So the total number of people who have the disease in a given year. So an example of prevalence is that here in the United States, there are approximately 1.2 million people currently infected with HIV. So the prevalence of HIV then in the U.S. would be 1.2 million people. The incidence, however, is the number of people who develop a new infection or disease in a given year. So the incidence of HIV in the U.S. is approximately 50,000 new infections every year. So prevalence is total number. Incidence is the number of new infections, both in a given year. Now, incidence rate is the number of new cases within a given population. So if we talk about how, uh, you know, with the population of the U.S., the incidence rate would be about 50,000 new infections of HIV every year. Now, in terms of transmission and infection of diseases, um, transmission and infection require an unbroken chain of events that'll, that must that allow for diseases to spread from one human to another. Uh, we refer to this thing a uh, pathogen, which is really just a disease producing microorganism, and it must have a portal of exit, a mode of transmission, a reservoir, and a susceptible victim in order to spread throughout a population or from individual to individual. Uh, the portal of exit is usually close to the organism's breeding site. So wherever this microorganism reproduces, that's typically near its portal of exit. So let's say if the microorganisms reproduce in the gut, chances are the portal of exit is either going to be via the mouth through vomiting or through the anus through diarrhea. So what this slide shows are the, these chain of events that can occur for the transmission of, of infection or disease. Uh, first of all, we need a reservoir. And a reservoir is basically just areas where this microorganism can persist in the environment, you know. So humans can be reservoirs. You know, example would be HIV. So, you know, humans here in the U.S. are reservoirs for HIV. Uh, animals can be reservoirs as well because there are zoonotic diseases or diseases that can spread from animals to humans. So other animals can be reservoirs. Insects are reservoirs like arthropods. So we know that... Um, we know that mosquitoes can be a reservoir for um, certain transmissible diseases, as well as soil. You know, certain microorganisms like uh, Bacillus anthracis or anthrax uh, normally actually exists in our soil. And so even just the earth beneath our feet is a reservoir for potentially infectious microorganisms. Now, uh, what, what, what needs to happen yes, next is that these microorganisms must travel from their reservoir through a portal of exit. And so this portal of exit, uh, let's say if it's a human or an animal or an insect, could either, either be through like the nasal mucosa or oral mucosa. And then this needs to be transmitted to another organism um, through this mode of transmission, which could either be through like an insect bite, uh, nasal droplets, like if you cough, cough or sneeze, um, semen, you know, if it's a sexually transmitted disease, or other body fluids that could spread from person to person, you know, like uh, fecal oral roots could be a mode of transmission. Now the portal of entry just refers to the area where this microorganism would, would, it, would it be able to infect a new uh, host. So a portal of entry for like a nasal droplet spread from another human or animal could be like the nasal or oral mucosa of another person where those microorganisms could first come into contact with a new host and then infect that host through either the nasal mucosa or oral mucosa. Otherwise, like skin abrasions or skin punctures, which can occur during sex, um, are also portals of entry for uh, certain sexually transmitted diseases. Now, what's also important to note 
It's just because you're exposed to an infectious microorganism doesn't necessarily mean that you will be infected or that infection will persist or lead to disease. So there also is a degree of susceptibility that, that's required. So susceptible victims are uh, more likely to become infected once exposed to an infectious microorganism. So some things that can sus increase your susceptibility to, to disease would be things like malnourishment, if you're unimmunized, you know, if you chose not to receive the MMR vaccine, um, or if you're immunocompromised, you know, let's say if, uh, due to old age, um, possibly, uh, you know, a genetic defect in the immune system, or even, uh, you know, AIDS. Now, transmission is really just the word we use to describe any mechanism by which an infection, infectious agent is spread. Uh, there's both direct and indirect transmissions. Direct transmission would be exposure to body fluids like droplets, uh, having animal bites or exposure, exposure to soil that carries a microorganism, or even, even through placental transfer. So what we find then is that uh, pregnant mothers can sometimes transfer uh, infectious microorganisms from their blood through the placenta now into the fetus's bloodstream. So there's cases where you know a mother with HIV can spread virus through the placenta into her um, you know, unborn fetus that way. Otherwise, viruses can cross the placenta as well. Uh, there is also indirect tr transmission, which is also going to be uh, due to exposure of uh, vehicle-borne um, microorganisms. So you know, microorganisms might piggyback on a, you know, a particular uh, structure, like a fomite, like a doorknob or something. Uh, there are vector-borne transmissions where uh, vectors like mosquitoes could carry an infectious mi microorganism, and by being bitten by the mosquito, you sort of indirectly be uh, are, uh, indirectly exposed to that microorganism. Um, and there are also is a form of airborne transmission where uh, if you're exposed to um, a microorganism that maybe is aerosolized or sort of floating around the environment, how that's also a mode of indirect transmission. Now, infection control really just boils down to breaking the chain of events in that process of transmission. So either destroying the reservoirs and vectors, blocking the portals of exit or entry. And uh, the most effective way to break the chain of transmission, though, in most cases, is just hand washing. So something as simple as washing your hands throughout the day or also avoiding touching your face too frequently can prevent uh, in the spread of infection. So what we see here is that slide that looks similar to what we saw before. However, what we see here then is, is that you can break these chains. By breaking the links of the chain, then you prevent this microorganism from spreading from one phase to the next, and thereby you don't uh, you know, spread, uh, spread that infection. So this can be done by either destroying the vector, so you know, getting rid of mosquitoes, uh, having adequate waste disposal or sewage treatment, uh, you know, blocking the portal of exit is also important too. So having uh, infectious, infect, infected patients wear masks, gloves, uh, have you know isolation or use of condom can also spread, uh, prevent the spread of uh, you know infectious microorganisms by blocking their portal of exit. Otherwise, you can also block the mode of transmission by proper sterile technique, uh, body substance isolation, hand washing, or thorough cooking of food. Uh, blocking the portal entry could also relate to how people who are currently uninfected could also wear masks, gloves, and condoms to also prevent the uh, microorganism organism from uh, infecting themselves or also reducing their susceptibility. So vaccination, having optimal rest, which therefore would support you know a strong immune system, and having optimal nutrition as well would also support a strong immune system. Now, uh, there is a role of the host in uh, infection, and this relates to uh, the immune response. And so the immune response is going to be a series of cells that are involved with recognizing foreign microorganisms and mounting a proper response to remove those microorganisms from your body. Now, there's two main different types of immune responses. We have innate and specific immune responses. Innate immune responses are due to a series of cells that can respond to a variety of different types of molecules or microorganisms, and they just sort of indiscriminately will target things that are foreign to your body. So if there's a foreign substance or microorganism, 
the innate immune response can recognize this and remove that from your body through a variety of mechanisms that we'll talk about in future chapters. Now, the specific immune response is what, also what we call the adaptive immunity. So specific or adaptive immunity is more slow to develop, and it only develops upon exposure to that substance or microorganism. However, after exposure, once these immune elements have now been formed, your immune system can now more efficiently uh, remove those microorganisms on subsequent exposures. And we'll talk more about what this specific immune response is in future chapters. Now, uh, throughout your body, we have mechanical and biochemical barriers that also aid in the immune system. Uh, these don't involve necessarily immune cells, but rather they are uh, parts of, um, of an immune type barrier you find in your body that can help also help prevent infection. So an example of some biochemical barriers in your body would be the fact that in many secretions like tears and saliva and other mucus secretions, you find an enzyme called lysozyme in those secretions. So in tears, lysozyme uh, breaks down bacterial cell walls and thereby prevents infection of the eyes. Uh, you find that in sebaceous glands, there are also immune elements that can be incorporated into the oil secretions of your skin and on the shaft of hair to also prevent too much infection on skin. Um, we have micro, microbiota, in, or also called flora, in our gut and all throughout your body, really, that these, uh, these microbial flora can prevent infection by competitively inhibiting infection. So basically, these flora set up shop in the mucous membranes of your body, and they don't cause harm to your body necessarily, but they do prevent infection by competitively out-competing other bad bacteria, right? So if they can use up all the space and nutrients in a given area, then other potentially pathogenic bacteria can't get a foothold. Uh, other vaginal secretions can also uh, contain uh, antimicrobial products. Uh, so biochemical and mechanical barriers can be, include things like mucus, which can trap um, debris and microorganisms before it gets too deep into your uh, mucous membranes. We have cilia that lines your respiratory tract that also removes uh, in, you know, mucus up and out of your airway. Skin is a really good barrier too because your skin cells are held so tightly together that it's difficult for microorganisms to slip between those cells. Otherwise, uh, also like the acid in your stomach can help uh, clear out infection um, from the food you eat. And other secretions from like the prostate or testicular fluid um, can also uh, have antimicrobial type of uh, reactions. Now, some risk factors for infection include things like nutritional status, age, and chronic illness. You know, proper nutrition will promote uh, an adequate immune system. If someone's malnourished, then they can have depressed immune function, and this can put them at risk for infection. Otherwise, age also plays a role in infection. Uh, the very young and the very old are more susceptible to infection for um, Similar but different reasons. Very young and very old individuals are both at risk for infection because they both have immuno uh, incompetence. So basically their immune system isn't well developed or well formed enough to prevent infection that say from you know the rest of the human population. So for the very young, though, it's different than the very old because for the very young, they have an immature immune system. You know, when you're first born, your immune system isn't necessarily ready to go, and it takes time for your immune system to learn how to fight infection. So for the very young, they have immature immune systems. And opposite to this, for the very old, they're susceptible to infection, not because their immune system isn't well, is uh, immature, but rather they have a degenerating immune function due to a loss of immune cells. You know, as you get older, it's more difficult for cells to divide and you start to lose total white blood cell counts. And so for the very old, uh, they have, uh, you know, less immune cells available to fight infection. Otherwise, chronic illness can also uh, put you at risk for, for uh, infection or disease because uh, it can alter your host's ability to resist that infection. You know, if your immune system is fighting some other form of chronic illness, like let's say if you're chronically infected with pneumonia, that could put you at risk for 
other infections around your body because maybe most of your immune system is uh, you know trying to clear off that pneumonia infection rather than necessarily uh, working on like a gut infection or something. Now, uh, immunosuppression is a risk factor, and so we talked about how um, you know the elderly are immunosuppressed, and uh, there's different there's different causes of immunosuppression. Um, for one, there are certain genetic disorders that can lead to immunosuppression. Uh, Anti-rejection medications. So if you take a medication after receiving a tissue or organ transplant, those anti-rejection meds often suppress the immune system, you know, to prevent your own body from rejecting the organ. But this in itself can also put you at risk for other infections. Otherwise, ex exposure to steroids for autoimmune disease. Uh, immunosuppressive therapies for autoimmune disease, you know, autoimmune disease, disease itself can put you at risk for infection, as well as HIV, because this virus uh, tar specifically targets immune cells and would thereby put you at risk for uh, infection in the long term. Stre we know that stress is also a risk factor for infection because stress hormones like cortisol are believed to depress immune function. What we see then is that when stress hormones elevate, immune function correspondingly decreases. So these things are sort of negatively correlated. And it turns out that uh, people who are chronically stressed, you know, physiologically, uh, are more at risk for infection. Now, uh, you know, immunization plays a role in altering your susceptibility to infection. And it's really the most cost-effective method at altering your susceptibility. Now, uh, there's a lot of different types of vaccinations or immunizations against infectious microorganisms. And really the goal of immunization is to confer immunity onto someone before they've actually ever been exposed to a live, virulent, and potentially infectious microorganism. So by properly vaccinating enough individuals in a population, you can decrease the number of susceptible hosts, and this can confer what we call herd immunity. Uh, herd immunity is a really interesting concept where once enough people in a population are vaccinated, it makes it very unlikely for diseases to spread because there's less available hosts for that microorganism to spread from host to host in a population. So it's not necessary for everyone in a population to be vaccinated. But there's a, often a certain threshold for the number of individuals sufficient to confer herd immunity and therefore make it less likely for this microorganism to spread uh, throughout a population. And, you know, the, the Center for Disease Control or CDC is always providing updates and recommendations for, for immunizations, you know, in terms, of, in terms of age or boosters and that, that kind of stuff. Now, the environment plays a role as well. We know this because the environment... Um, can be a place where you could be exposed. It could be um, uh, an area where diseases can spread. So proper sanitation, air quality, living conditions, and climate are all important factors in whether or not a microorganism can spread uh, in a given area. Now, earlier we talked about how microbial flora also protect against infection. And I mentioned briefly how the microbial flora, which you find in your mucous membranes of like, let's say your gut, um, you know, genital urinary tracts as well. Um, <clears throat> these are considered good bacteria. Uh, they live on or in the host without causing disease. So these, these are actually commensal bacteria. So basically they... Um, live in or on our body, but they don't cause disease. And they can also, uh, you know, sort of feed off of the nutrients that are available in or on our bodies. Now, these resident or normal flora will benefit because we give those microorganisms a place to grow and, and flourish. Um, and we benefit from the presence of those microorganisms because they don't cause disease in our bodies and also prevent infection from uh, other uh, potentially pathogenic microorganisms. So if the host immune system is compromised though, these resident flora could become pathogenic. So uh, what's interesting is certain microorganisms like Clostridium difficile or C. diff, it turns out that this microorganism can cause disease in humans. And you talk about people who suffer with chronic C. diff infection. 
it turns out that most people, and the chances are everyone, has a certain degree of this microorganism as a part of their normal flora. Now, as long as conditions are okay and some and someone has a, has a, a normally functioning immune system, Clostridium difficile shouldn't cause disease in the individual. However, if they're immunosuppressed or if other microbial flora are disrupted, this may give an opportunity for that particular microorganism to flourish uh, in abnormal numbers and cause disease in the host. So there's a, there's a very delicate balance here that needs to be established. Otherwise, you could get opportunistic infections where uh, normal flora may are actually cause disease. Um, in their host. Now we use this word virulence to describe a microorganism's ability to cause disease and um, really it's just another way to, to talk about how it can cause harm to the host. So we, when we talk about the virulence of a particular microorganism um, this can refer to how much harm this microorganism could cause. Now some of the virulence factors include things like toxins, exotoxins, and endotoxins that a microorganism could produce. Uh, we talk about toxins as being like the lipopolysaccharide produced by bacteria. Uh, LPS or lipopolysaccharide, this is actually a component of the bacterial cell membrane. And when these bacterial cells die, or basically um, lice, uh, this lipopolysaccharide is, is relinquished from the cell membrane and it's considered a toxin because this can lead to um, excessive immune responses in an individual's body, which can lead to tissue damage. Now, exotoxins, however, are a aspect of a living cell, such as a bacterium, that are actually secreted or excreted by that living cell. So the examples of exotoxins could be like botulinum toxin, which is given off by Clostridium botulinum, this is a toxin that's secreted by living cells uh, into a host, and uh, this is actually going to increase. This actually increases the virulence of that particular microorganisms. Uh, now, endotoxins, however, are usually part of the cell wall of a microorganism. Those are released when those microorganisms die or um, while the cells are growing. Um, an example of an endotoxin uh, could be like uh, the lipopolysaccharide on Clostridium difficile, um, if this gets released in too high of concentration, so like if you kill off too much C. diff too rapidly, this can actually lead to uh, shock and it actually is not a good thing to kill off too many of these bacteria at once because this can lead to too much endotoxin release. So a challenge with C. diff infection is that they have to be killed off more slowly sufficient that you don't get too much endotoxin being, re being released simultaneously. Um, other bacterial enzymes can be secreted in exotoxins and this can help, help um, those bacteria spread or invade tissues. Things like coagulase um, are all involved with breaking apart tissues and, and aiding in the spread of those bacteria. Um, hyaluronidase is actually involved with breaking down also tissues and helping bacterial spread. Um, and cytolysins can, can break apart cells and, uh, again, help bacterial, bacterial cells spread throughout a given tissue. Um, now, in uh, some bacteria can produce what we call antiphagocytic factors. Now, what these antiphagocytic factors confer is essentially uh, resistance to phagocytosis. And phagocytosis is a process where immune cells can engulf foreign microorganisms and degrade those microorganisms using a, what's called a phagolysosome. Um, some antiphagocytic factors include like uh, coating or biofilms, and these prevent phagocytosis by your immune system. Uh, in fact, tuberculosis, like so mycobacterium tuberculosis, actually has a really good antiphagocytic factors and therefore uh, has more virulent infections because it resists phagocytosis by your own body's immune cells. Um, other ways that microorganisms could can evade the immune system is that they might produce endospores. Uh, these endospores can can survive under really harsh environmental conditions and therefore these bacteria could uh, persist for long periods of time or even survive pretty harsh conditions like uh, autoclave where you use high heat and um, 
basically water to try to, to try to kill off more microorganisms. Um, certain other microorganisms actually have mobility factors as well, such as cilia or flagella, and this allows them to basically evade immune cells by kind of running away. Um, or they can swim towards nutrients uh, through a process we call chemotaxis. Um, antimicrobial resistance uh, includes those things we mentioned prior, <clears throat> and it also includes four main mechanisms here. Um, bacteria can produce enzymes that can actually ina inactivate drugs. They can create um, new uh, metabolic pathways that might evade a particular uh, antibiotic or drug. They could prevent the entry of a drug into a cell or actively pump that drug out of the cell. And so it's a mixture of these four mechanisms that really help uh, bacteria and micro other microorganisms to uh, be more resistant to a drug we may use to try to fight infection. And typically resistance develops due to chance mutation, whereby uh, due to a random mutation, it may actually improve a microorganism's ability to survive against a given drug. And if this microorganism is more likely to survive against this drug, then it's also more likely to uh, you know, spread its genes on to the next population of, of cells. So upon subsequent generations, then what you end up with then are more and more of these microorganisms that are resistant to this drug. And so, um, you know, due to chance alone, this could actually lead to resistance. So it's really, every time you take an antibiotic, it's really just a roll of the dice. You know, is that antibiotic going to lead to resistance where you could have, due to chance mutation, a microbe that just doesn't respond well to that antibiotic and therefore is more likely to survive um, and spread to the next generation. Um, antimicrobial resistance is also um, increased by subtherapeutic dosing where someone might take an antibiotic for several days, feel better, but then um, choose to stop taking their antibiotic which means that if there were any resistant bacteria or microorganisms, they could survive that antibiotic regimen and um, you know, future infections can be more resistant to the antibiotic. So it's important to consider the fact that you should be taking the, the entire dose of antibiotics, not just taking an antibiotic until you feel better. Um, and also excessive use of, of antibiotics. You know, um, it, you know, we, this whole idea of antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic resistance um, has really been a hot topic in the last decade or so, or two decades. Um, and it's come about from many decades of abuse of antibiotics. You know, we've been prescribing antibiotics for viral infections where, you know, someone may have a virus, but the antibiotic does nothing to that virus. We just think that because they're ill, they need an antibiotic and that's going to make them better. Um, and what, what happens is every time that someone takes an antibiotic, you're rolling a dice because there's a chance that, you know, due to chance mutation, it, you may have bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic. And due to excessive use of antibiotics, we've rolled the dice a lot. And because we've rolled the dice a lot, there's, you know, many opportunities for bacteria to be resistant to this antibiotic. Now, the susceptible strains of that bacteria will die, but the resistant strains will emerge and persist. So upon many uh, uses of antibiotics, then you're more and more likely to, to find resistant strains of bacteria. Um, there are many examples of antibiotic-resistant bacteria out there now, like we have methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. There is triply-resistant tuberculosis now, um, and lots of other uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Now, if the last part of this chapter, we're going to wrap up talking about the major types of infectious microorganisms you can find. And what's, what's interesting is that uh, there's a variety of microorganisms that are infectious, you know, it includes things like fungi, protozoa, or eukaryotes. Um, it includes uh, bacteria and uh, even protein. So proteins can be infectious as well. Now we'll first start with bacteria. These are single-celled organisms that don't have any organelles. Uh, we call these prokaryotes. They degrade and break down dead tissue or other organisms, and there's many numerous types of bacteria. You know, 
uh, I think we've characterized thousands of types of bacteria, but we really only understand the types of bacteria that cause disease in humans. But really, there's um, chances are there's many other bacteria out there that, that we know nothing about because they don't cause disease in humans, and therefore, uh, you know, scientists and um, you know medical scientists aren't as interested in those particular bacteria. Um, only a small number of bacteria on the planet are actually harmful to humans because the human environment is only really going to be hospitable to certain types of bacteria, not all bacteria. An example of this would be, you know, if, if there's a bacterium that likes to live in the hot thermal pools of like a hot spring where the temperatures can exceed, you know, the boiling point of water, um, this may, that particular bacterium may not prefer to live in the human body, which differs dramatically from that particular environment. Now, bacteria comes in, come in different shapes. We have cocci, which are spherical. They can come in clusters and chains or pairs or tetrads. Uh, they can also be bacilli or rod-shaped, vibrio, which are kind of comma-shaped, and spirilla, which are twisted and, and sort of rod-shaped as well. Um, now, the bacteria also could have uh, different types of cell walls or membranes. Uh, we talk about gram-positive versus gram-negative bacteria. It turns out gram-positive bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan cell wall and therefore stain really dark purple using a gram stain underneath the microscope. Uh, gram negative bacteria kind of appear kind of pinkish because they don't stain as well using a gram stain and they have a more thin peptidoglycan and a lipopolysaccharide outer membrane. Otherwise there's acid fast bacteria as well which resist staining but once they're stained they uh, resist decoloration. This is another way to, to determine the structure of a bacterial um, cell membrane. And you might wonder, what's the point? Why even, why even talk about the structure of a membrane based on the staining? Well, if you know the structure of a bacterial membrane, then you can actually know what drugs can be used to target a particular uh, bacterium. Because there are antibiotics that are better used for certain types of bacteria, like gram-positive or gram-negative bac bacteria. Uh, bacteria also uh, have different oxygen requirements. Some are aerobic, meaning they prefer oxygen. Some are anaerobic, which means they persist in oxygen poor or very low oxygen environments. Uh, pathogenic bacteria commonly affect certain parts of the human body. So they can penetrate initial defense mechanisms. They'll multiply and create colonies. They can cause inflammations and um, they can also move throughout your body's fluid system, such as blood and lymph. Um, but fortunately, we have an immune system to clear off those bacteria. Now, these bacteria often stimulate immune responses, and they can overwhelm lymph nodes. They can cause bacterial emboli or cell masses that can travel throughout your blood system and clog uh, vessels. They can cause microabscesses or basically small sections of tissue that are degraded. And they can also lead to sepsis, which is widespread. Um, infection throughout your body. Now bacteria differ, differ from viruses because viruses are the smallest known infective agents. Uh, they're composed of a protein shell we call a capsid. Uh, viruses are either DNA or RNA in terms of their genome structure and some also have a protective envelope around their capsid. Uh, this, so this is showing a general structure of a virus. We can have a little envelope around this virus we, have a, we typically have a, a protein nucleocapsid here, and then a core which has uh, nucleic acids and enzymes. Uh, this nucleic acid could either be DNA or RNA, and some viruses package their own enzymes that are aid in their uh, ability to infect, like enzymes that could replicate their genome or help to hijack host cell machinery. Now there are two major types of viruses. We have DNA and RNA viruses. Uh, DNA viruses uh, produce messenger RNA that the host cell machinery will use to make viral proteins. This, these viral proteins then will assemble in the host cell and then um, basically rearrange into new viral virions, which are just new infectious particles. So these DNA viruses and RNA viruses basically just hijack a host cell's machinery in order to replicate and divide. Now, RNA viruses include viruses like retroviruses. Um, it turns out that RNA, RNA viruses evolve or change more quickly because their error rate is much higher. 
uh, which means that they will uh, accumulate mutations and thereby change more rapidly than DNA viruses. Um, RNA viruses include a class of, of viruses called retroviruses, which contain enzymes that can convert RNA into DNA. We call this reverse transcriptase. And by converting this RNA genome into DNA, it's that DNA genome can be inserted into the host cell's DNA. So with retroviruses, they basically can insert their genome into the host cell genome and become part of that host cell. Um, these RNA viruses will replicate within the cytoplasm, produce mRNA, which is then translated into viral protein, and then this also produces new viruses that um, can leave the cell and go on to infect other nearby cells. Other infectious organisms include fungi. Um, these are eukaryotic microorganisms, which form complex structures and really thick, rigid cell walls made of chitin. Uh, mycoses are infections by fungi. And because fungi are eukaryotic, just like our own body cells, it's difficult to find drugs that target fungi and not our body cells because we share similar biology to the eukaryotic cells of uh, fungi. Now, um, certain fungi do live in our bodies. They're part of the normal flora, like candida. And so you can find candida albicans in some of the mucous membranes of your body, like the oral and genital urinary tracts. But when you're immunocompromised, those fungi can overgrow and cause local or systemic infections. So it's common to see candida infections in people who take excessive amounts of antibiotics um, or suffer from immunocompromised. Uh, immunocompromised um, conditions such as AIDS. Now, some fungal infections can be superficial, which means they're only found um, sort of in the dead or keratinized par portion of your skin. Uh, these don't invade deeper uh, parts of tissue, but they can cause inflammation, which can be irritating and uh, you know cause local discomfort. Now, other uh, fungal infections can be subcutaneous which means they can cause ulcers or abscesses by invading deeper tissues. Um, if those subcutaneous fungi get into the circulatory system, they can go systemic, and this tends to be more serious because it can spread all throughout your body. Pretty much any organ that receives blood flow could be susceptible to that fungal infection. And again, fungal infections can be difficult to clear out because it's difficult to find drugs that target fungi and not human cells because we share similar, um, basically, biological processes. Uh, there are lots of different types of parasites, and parasites include things like protozoa, or single-celled animals, or helminths, such as worms, like roundworms and flatworms. There are other parasites, such as arthropods as well, or insects, um, that have jointed appendages that are also basically parasitic and, and live off of our body. Um, these parasitic infections can vary wildly depending on the type of organism and the site of infection, but some common sites of infestations are skin as well as the GI tract.